April 11, 2001. The year may begin with a 2, but the 90s are still going full speed ahead. Solo cops look like this. This is the pinnacle of entertainment. PlayStation 2? What's that? The people are bored with literally nothing to entertain them. They are growing restless, and the good life is certainly not quite enough. What can they do? What can they see? A franchise based on that book? What if you did a ton of math? Then, out of the shadows, something happened. A light bulb of inspiration. Or perhaps a mountain of cocaine. Yes. Welcome everyone to Josie and the Pussycats. 2001? Nah, this is one of the most 90s things I've ever seen. Look at that color palette. Look at people actually liking boy bands. They're not even from Korea. Satire is still alive. Product placement is actually a joke. Directors Harry Elfond and Deborah Kaplan captured the best possible image of pop culture in the late 90s, the Disneyland version. The one that will be used as a backbone for satire on the next nostalgia show about teens in Wisconsin. The setting? Riverdale, 2001. The largest concern of the average resident is whether or not the TV guide is on the mailbox and why their investment in Pets.com didn't work out as well as it could have. Pets.com, because pets can't drive. Oh yeah, oh, this is my kind of party. These are not your 70s Josie and the Pussycats, though. You still have characters called Josie, Valerie and Melody, a love interest, a manager, and a pet. The 70s ones sadly were killed when they absentmindedly got thrown in space and you had a 70s teen managing the controls of the spaceship. We open not with the Pussycats, but with a much more interesting band, Du Jour, the final boss of every boy band that could into the charts by letting you know that you are the one for them, girl. Their power is such that 2001 Seth Green pursued his other passion in this universe. Du Jour also features Dr. Christopher Turk on the job he did to pay for college and have to keep secret from his boyfriend. Fortunately for him, eight years in medical school brings the band's collective intelligence up to that of an average human being which is why they are able to notice there is something odd about their manager, and decide to tell it to the most trustworthy person that they know. Their manager Wyatt, played by Alan Cumming. Gee, you know, I've no idea what that was. Really? Who wouldn't trust a guy like that? Well, they are friends and they have been working together for a while. Not to mention, if he is indeed responsible for this, he can still play it a million different ways. He could feign ignorance, he could pretend to be concerned for their well-being and then promise that he will look into it. He could make sure that the demos sent to them are clean. Of course, the easiest and quickest solution to this is to add a bit somewhere telling them to ignore the subliminal messages in the... Murder is also a good option, yes, very underused these days, but surprisingly effective. And now that he has actually parachuted into our plot, we get our first glance at the pussycats in the most 90s ways possible. Oh god, it's all coming back. Daria, King of the Hill, MTV as a commercially viable property, Triangles, Clarissa, little trucks filled with vapid teenage girls, oh god, oh god! Yes, Riverdale, where all car insurance commercials are filmed. The only ones not fitting in are our main characters, Josie the Fiery Redhead, played by Rachel Lee Cook, Valerie, the sassy bassist, played by Rosario Dawson, and in a casting choice that will baffle directors for generations, Tara Reid as Melody, the heart of the group. Lord knows how she prepared herself for that role. The Pussycats are, of course, once again managed by Alexander Cabot, who is a better manager here than in the show, if only because this time it doesn't seem like he's trying to actively kill his stars. And, ah yes, Alexandra. Why is she here again? I'm here because I was in the comic book. I'll allow it. Speaking of which, Alan Love Interest is here. Looking less like Fred and more like... Shaggy. Good, we've established he exists. We'll check if he still has a pulse later. Because while he was busy playing guitar and not scrapping his old truck, Alan the manager has used the considerable wealth and power of the pre-iTunes record industry to release the Alter Du Jure tape verify that the effects are working and dealing with people who have created a tolerance for it. Well, first of all, I don't understand what... 
gosh, that's fascinating. Once his SUV is finally dropshipped, he gets to the task of finding a replacement for what seemed to be one of the most successful boy bands on the planet. Not an easy task, especially when he has apparently limited himself to looking in Riverdale, the most milk toast, cultureless town in America, the one place where this cockamamie scheme of his will have a 100% success rate. What, does he expect the band to just fall from the sky? Yeah, he knows the script just did that. Hello, ladies. I've been told that you wanted some great British beef. So the Pussycats go through the same process that Netflix uses to approve a show, and in a single scene transition they have everything they wished for. Even the love interest prestige luggage comes along for the ride. Apparently they didn't actually wish for a better script. It does call for a wonderfully silly makeover montage, and a billboard on the section of the movie with the least advertising. Well, we're nearly at the half hour mark on this shindig, so how about we meet the villain, the woman behind the man, the real mastermind behind the evil conspiracy, the... <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry, uh, this is Fiona, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm new to this, I'll push through. This is Fiona, played by Parker Posey, and wearing the latest fashion from her stylist. From this command center, we control the most influential demographic of the entire population. We decide everything! Well, she can't be that bad. She even hired Eugene Levy to carry some of the burden. I'm here to talk about subliminal messages in rock and roll music. Thank you, Mr. Exposition. Meanwhile, back at the ranch... The walls are mushy! <laughs> Fortunately, a nice half of lithium and some subliminal messaging later, they are ready for the crescendos montage, where they get famous in a matter of... Huh. One month. The guy on CSI solving cases in a day may be disappointed, but it's not a bad time if you consider that Mega Records probably isn't just working on these three. Wait! Does anyone else think it's a little strange that all this happened in a week? Well, I guess the Billboard Weekly chart is published daily nowadays. What's the point of being famous if the people you hated at high school don't want to kiss your ass? <laughs> You're lucky. Most people have to wait till their 10 year reunion for that sort of revenge. Or shall we? And speaking of the future. Operation Big Concert. Where we finally take things to the next level. Isn't that what you should be doing anyway? Also, a massive shout out to the Foley guy for this. Excuse me. This plot seems to be going a little too well. The Pussycats are already famous. Fiona is on the verge of securing the funds of the single silliest waste of my tax dollars since Midnight Basketball. But we're still under an hour in. This is bad. Without some padding, we'll have the bad guys win and make the youth of America a complacent bunch perfectly happy to sit in front of a screen all day. But they will do so under an hour. Now how do we solve this in the most generic and 90s way possible? Oh, I know, the second act breakdown. It should be easy enough and it was perfected over endless rom-coms throughout the decade. Here's how you can create one for your future project in just 5 minutes of film. First comes the setup. The most important thing for setting up one is establishing an easy way out. Remember, the padding should only be there long enough to get you over the 90 minute mark with credits. Fortunately. Alan M is sitting right there, waiting for the right time to remind them that they're real. Now the setup itself. You need a reason to break them up. Nobody fucked up in the first act, so we need to think of something that will create vast amounts of doubt and uneasiness on all parties. I'm Fiona! Welcome to your party! This is my girly room. Come on girls, sit down, we'll gossip. Come on. That'll do. And now we need the trigger event. This is the remix of your next single. I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. Which creates a fight between the main cast. I'm hearing someone glomming on to my talent and my credit. Until one of them realizes the error of their ways. You should have a solo career. You could have your own primetime TV series. Oh my god, that's Mr. Movie Phone. How did you get him to put that on there? Oh, you slept with him. 
right in time for the villains to find out. I'll help. You know I'm just gonna let you walk right out of here and spoil everything. What's that? Still a bit short. How's about we splice it with Carson Daly getting the shit kicked out of him? Not strictly necessary, but very much welcome. And so we arrive at the conclusion of this epic shindig in which Josie, now armed with... Um... Mosface, Fiona and Wyatt, who are selected to go into battle wearing only their finest candy wrappers. Look, I said forget it, alright? Now find yourself another girl. <laughs> yeah, you see, I would! But everybody's already here! Oh, how I hope the stage falls on her. Also, is it just me or is the background music turning into the Men in Black soundtrack? Anyway, we are in the darkest hour for the Pussycats. Thanks to the magic of a car bomb, Wyatt and Fiona's victory is only minutes away. And not even a sappy love and friendship speech from Josie could stop them now. Those two guys are tied, what's his face probably OD'd on pills after Josie blew him off for the millionth time, there is really nobody who can save us. We will. The cold opening to the rescue, but how? Oh, well, we managed to land the plane just fine. Unfortunately, it was in the parking lot of a Metallica shop. Okay, that's a good one. But as it turns out, they're not ready for another ass-kicking. A Stork gets one hit killed. Nevertheless, it's time for the climax. The epic battle that would set everything right and... Oh my god, it's the dweebiest fight ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. Actually, Fiona seems to be competing for the DCS performance here, so maybe. As I said, biggest waste of tax dollars. And lest we forget about that foreshadowing. Lisa. Lisa Snyder. Lifting Letha. Lisa, it's me, Wally, white ass Wally. Makeup. I I learned to speak with our lips. <laughs> Isn't it the strangest coincidence? No, the strangest coincidence happened about an hour ago. This is more like an eight on that scale, eight and a half tops. So what's the moral of the story here? Freaks should date other freaks. You guys are still here. Holy shit, that girl's got a skunk on her head. Okay, that's two good ones. So Wyatt and Fiona get arrested and blamed for the entire subliminal message ploy. Nobody is particularly sad. And after one final motivational speech from Josie, the Pussycats realize their lifelong dream, performing to a pack audience that likes them for who they are. You know, I'm wondering through all of this, do they still have a label? Presumably everything related to Mega Records will be seized. Not to mention that without the console science thingy mixing them to hell and back, they now have to stand on their own merits again. But yeah, everyone seems happy now. Wait a week for the effects of the messaging to really wear off and see how it goes. That's before the legal fights. At best the three of them will be subpoenaed. Hopefully all those sponsorship deals will get them a good lawyer. But at least Josie and Alan M get together, so that's nice. Well, that was certainly 98 minutes of my life. And yet, just from the visual style alone, I'm ready to forgive its flaws. It's always a joy to watch Alan Cumming acting like a snitty little prick. Even the soundtrack is decent enough if you have a high tolerance for exactly the kind of music that the movie implicitly condemns. Bear in mind, however, that none of it is performed by the screen talent. Studio musicians and the lead vocalist of Letters to Cleo are the way to go if you want more. Unfortunately, five months to the day of this movie's release, the planet changed and things became taller and less willing to stand out. The few that did went on a more aggressive, confrontational nature. O2 belonged to Eminem, O3 gave us the Matrix Reloaded. The night is were over and this ended up as a cult flick, whatever that means. I guess it's fair enough. After all, the producers were wrong. Subliminal messaging works better on short videos anyway. <laughs> 